Hello everyone, uh, I welcome you all for today's class. We will uh, briefly look at uh, what we uh, discussed last time and then proceed further. In the last class we saw how the uh, uh, oxazolidinones were used uh, for the formation of uh, uh, Z-enolate and how the Z-enolates uh, are then allowed to react with uh, the uh, alkylating uh, species and uh, the oxazolidinones are basically derived from different amino acids and the configuration of the um, substituents on the uh, auxiliary such as this for example here uh, topropyl group uh, it determines the, the uh, orientation of the incoming electrophile when the enolate is reacting with the electrophilic species. And uh, uh, we also saw how the aldol products are formed. In the formation of the aldol product that we saw that the oxygen metal bond which is uh, boron enolate that is metal here is boron. How does that form it is a kind of uh, intramolecular chelation to make this bicyclic system here and when the aldehyde comes in contact with this uh, uh, particular bicyclic enolate uh, chelated species then the, the oxygen boron bond breaks and the uh, oxygen uh, of the aldehyde comes in contact with the boron and therefore we uh, see that uh, Zimmermann Traxler uh, transition state and then we uh, see the aldol product formed. And during that process we also looked at how the dipoles of the uh, this enol uh, part and the oxygen carbon part of the auxiliary they repel each other when the aldehyde forms the chelation with the boron and therefore the orientation goes back and then that allows the uh, specific orientation of the aldehyde where our group is equatorially oriented followed by then the attack of the enolate from the C phase leads to the product formation which is synaldol. Now uh, when the synaldol is formed we had no surprise because that is what was expected. But how do we get then e antialdol? For the antialdol formation we saw that if we use extra Lewis acid then that extra Lewis acid uh, does not uh, allow the aldehyde to kind of break the enolate of the boron and the so chelation remains uh, intact as it is here and then the uh, Lewis acid interacts with the aldehyde and disposes the aldehyde in such a fashion that the carbonyl of the uh, uh, aldehyde and uh, this particular enolate they are away from each other this particular uh, carbonyl group of the oxalidine uh, oxazolidine in part they are away in the transition state and that allows the formation of the anti aldol <coughs> then more importantly towards the end we uh, so uh, try to look at the uh, uh, enol silyl ether to be formed uh, from a substrate like this uh, and see what is known as uh, ireland claisen rearrangement so uh, i have taken up this ireland claisen rearrangement first uh, instead of taking claisen rearrangement um, because in ireland claisen rearrangement there is a, um, a very strong uh, influence of the formation of the geometry of formation and geometry of the enolate and therefore i thought it was relevant that we do it discuss it right along with this particular uh, boron enolate part. So in that uh, case what we do is if we start with this and we, we carry out a deprotonation here. So basically it is allyl ester which is then converted into the corresponding ester 
with the possibility of generating an, an anion here. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and therefore you have a possibility of a rearrangement which can occur in this fashion. So uh, this is how the reaction takes place and uh, as you can see the conditions are very stringent conditions. The LDA reacts uh, with this particular uh, compound or the ester in, in the presence of tertiary butyl dimethylsalyl chloride but the solvent is THF. And if the CHF solvent is used what you can see that this is the new part of the enolate that is formed and the R group which is already present here they are anti to each other or trans to each other. But if we keep everything else same but add extra HMPA which is hexamethyl phosphoric triamide which is having this structure you have Me, Me2, uh, N, uh, thrice P, O. This is what is hexamethyl phosphoric triamide, this is what is HMPA. So this particular uh, solvent uh, has the nitrogens, there are 3 nitrogens and they play a very crucial role. And in that situation as you can see here the OX group and the R group are cis to each other. So since now uh, the um, geometry of the enolate has been uh, achieved by different conditions they lead to different products as you can see here the R group and R1 group are cis to each other and here R and R1 group are trans to each other in the final product. So the, uh, the newly generated asymmetric centers are highly influenced uh, in both the cases by the geometry of the enolate and therefore we need to understand why is it so. First of all we will see how this uh, affects the the product formations. For example, if we take a case like this, this kind of uh, particular um, uh, substrate here where the geometry of the uh, double bond here is trans and then of course we have the corresponding ester here. In this case we have taken the geometry of the double bond as cis. So if we start with a substrate like this and you carry out the reaction in THF as we saw in the last uh, transparency and, and then we get the product which is cis product that is in THF. The same reaction if it is done in THF HMPA here we get the trans product here. The, so the, the, the methyl orientations are trans to each other. Are. This is not really a cis and trans in terms of the double bond but it is just a a way of de defining that, that the methyl groups and methyl groups are basically uh, towards the same side. Similarly methyl group and methyl group here are opposite side therefore it is trans. It is not something to do with the double bond cis trans or so. So we start with the trans double bond and we get a product which looks like this and if we do in THF HMPA the product is opposite to this. And with this cis double bond here if we carry out the reaction in THF we get this product and opposite of that we get in THF HMPA. So there is an enormous amount of uh, difference in terms of uh, uh, the uh, solvent effect. So as you can see in summarize here E double bond in starting material leads to EE transition state and uh, leads to cis products. So E uh, this is E and uh, double bond in starting material leads EE transition state. So obviously this and this are away from each other. So this is also E and therefore EE transition state leads to cis product and uh, if we take uh, Z E double bond in starting material uh, leads to ZE transition state for example here this is uh, E and if it is uh, THF HMPA then we get Z here and that leads to trans product. Now you can see here that when the, the rearrangement takes place here this is the bond that is going to form here and therefore this methyl is orienting up, this methyl is uh, equatorial in the transition state this is axial this is equatorial therefore axial equatorial on adjacent atoms will be cis to each other and here as you can see 
that this is equatorially oriented and this is also equatorially oriented and therefore uh, the, uh, the two equatorial groups on adjacent carbon atoms in the cyclic transition state that will lead to the formation of the product would be trans to each other. Therefore, in the transition state as you can see trans product is formed here it is going to be a cis kind of uh, orientation of the two methyl groups. So, that is how it leads to the formation of the cis products here and the trans products here that is what we are uh, basically trying to refer to. So, it is very clear that with various kinds of product distribution that we can see with different stereochemistry of the uh, double bond uh, and uh, different uh, solvent systems we can then expect the specific cis or trans orientations of the methyl groups in the product of methyl groups in this case, but there could be different substituents. So, we have to see why is this THF and THF HMPA this combination helps to make this particular enolate to be a, a cis or trans or E or Z. Now, uh, uh, here as you can see that uh, the uh, orientation of the uh, groups would be something like this where you have uh, where you have uh, uh, a carbonyl group here and of course you have uh, the uh, oxygen here and then you have uh, this particular uh, here you have a CH2 and you have a methyl group here and then of course you have a hydrogen here. Now, uh, when uh, the LDA that is lithium diisopropyl amide comes into this you, you are basically trying to have the uh, anion from the N lithium here first chelates with this oxygen here. This is what is the is required here and then of course, we have the uh, so, something like this uh, can be anticipated. So, lithium coordinates with the uh, with the uh, oxygen here and uh, and then the uh, we can write it here like this and the, this relation allows the orientation of the uh, the hydrogen here to be in this direction of course. Now, at this stage the the hydrogen can one the other hydrogen can be on this side or methyl can be here or vice versa that means methyl can be as we have seen it here it could also be methyl here or hydrogen here. So, in this particular case what is happening is now that in, uh, in, uh, in this such a transition state is required in THF where intramolecular chelation is possible and then interactions of the carbonyl versus methyl and carbonyl versus hydrogen are therefore important. Now, if we look at this transition state we can also look at and put it in this fashion and we can say that something like this is happening and we could uh, put it in this fashion that we have lithium here which is now chelating with this. Then you have a nitrogen here when you have isopropyl lithium diisopropyl amide amide and uh, then you have a hydrogen here of course and then here that could be a hydrogen here and the methyl here is one possibility. Of course, from here you will have this. So, this is the transition state that this is what I am referring it here. Now, as you can see that uh, in this particular position when the hydrogen is actual there is not much of steric hindrance. But if we try and look at the, um, the put it here and instead of these two if we, if we put the um, methyl group here and the hydrogen here then of course, there will be steric hindrance. Therefore, this chelation which is allowing the orientation of the hydrogen to be in this direction leads to the formation of the E enolate. So, this E enolate is formed because now the double bond is, is being formed here and therefore, the oxygen here enolate comes in here and the methyl are about uh, opposite to each other. So, uh, the intramolecular uh, chelation with the LDA that is possible 
in THF makes the transition state look like this which is what is, is uh, here in which the uh, hydrogen uh, prefers to be to be uh, in the uh, actual position and therefore the uh, methyl group is uh, in the equatorial form. And when the chelation occurs uh, then uh, for, uh, uh, the final product after deprotonation leads to the E enolate. Now what happens when we have the, the HMPA added to it? When HMPA is added to it this particular chelation uh, breaks, this particular chelation breaks and this particular chelation breaks here and the molecule remains free, there is no chelation at all. So there are two orientation that are possible, one is like this here the, and the other one is like this here. So now we have two possibilities, one the uh, in the transition state when the proton is being abstracted from here the methyl can have uh, orientation like this where you can expect uh, the uh, steric hindrance like this or like this where there is no steric hindrance, there is no steric hindrance here, there is a steric hindrance here. Therefore this when methyl group is orienting towards this side it is upon deprotonation leads to E enolate. On the other hand when the methyl group is on this side away from this large group here then of course the deprotonation leads to Z enolate. This is what happens because HMPA basically uh, with the its nitrogen as I mentioned earlier it has uh, three these nitrogens chelate with the lithium and therefore the lithium is not available for the intramolecular chelation with the oxygen that we saw in the case of only THF as a solvent. So this was the chelation that was possible in the absence of HMPA this, this chelation was possible but that chelation is absent when we add HMPA and therefore the Z enolate formation occurs. So this is how the uh, effect of the solvent uh, of HMPA versus uh, no HMPA the formation of uh, E enolate versus Z enolate occurs and that influences the geometry of the final product. Now we look at the Claisen arrangement which is not really dependent on the enolates, it is slightly different from what we have been doing it so far. It does not have a enolate but we are dealing with allyl or aryl vinyl ethers that is what is, uh, is important. Now in this case uh, what happens is it undergoes uh, a sigma tropic rearrangement. 3, 3 sigma tropic arrangement. If we have this aryl vinyl ether, so this is the vinyl part here and this is the aryl part here. If we take this and we number them as this is the bond that is to be broken and this is the here the bond will be formed. So the bond that is being broken is numbered as 1, 2, 3 and 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime. This is how it is undergoing cleavage uh, at the 1 and 1 prime and the bond formation will take place. So this is 1. Uh, prime and of course is 1, 2 and of course it is 3 here and here is going to be 3 prime, 2 prime and of course 1 prime. So bond is being formed here and the bond is being broken here. Of course this is already a bond present here in fact. So when this breaks of course uh, we, uh, we are writing in these two parts because there is a reason for that I will discuss in a while and once the bond formation takes place then of course you have um, enolization and that leads to the formation of the corresponding phenol. So allyl vinyl ether lead to two uh, allyl uh, phenol formation and uh, of course the transition state would look somewhat like this where the bond is being formed and the bond is being broken as you can see the two um, double bonds are, are breaking here and the two single bonds are being formed here. Now uh, as uh, we can see here if we uh, look at the transition state uh, with substituents around in, in non-aromatic uh, substrates then we can see that 
the R2 group here versus uh, R2 group here. Now here it is equatorially oriented and here it is axially oriented and the rest of the things are of course the same. So now if we look at this particular part we can see that the uh, this particular transition state where the R2 group is equatorially oriented is uh, definitely more favorable. So what uh, here is the E geometry is basically what we are referring to is R2 versus this particular group and here it is R2 versus uh, this. Uh, so this is what is Z and this is what is E. So it is uh, less favorable and that is more favorable but we will look at it little more detail. Now if we start with uh, two uh, molecules of this kind uh, having an asymmetric center here and if these are chiral molecules but they have two uh, different types of double bonds in which in this case it is a trans double bond in this case it is a cis double bond and since this um, reaction is a concerted reaction so what we get is a product of this kind from this starting material and a product of this kind with this starting material and of course the chirality is also transferred in the product that means the products are also chiral because the starting materials are chiral. So what it means that by changing the configuration at the allylic double bond, this is the allylic double bond, one can get different configurations in the products. For example, in this particular case, the two methyl groups are beta oriented and in this case, one is beta and the other is alpha oriented. And of course, as I mentioned, since the reaction is concerted, the chirality is transferred into the product. So uh, the geometry of the initial molecule is very important. Now we are taking at uh, looking at this slightly differently here is that uh, we take uh, uh, without taking the absolute configuration into picture if we take the allyl uh, vinyl ether the, the, uh, the Claisen rearrangement starting material like this for example then we can look at it in a slightly different way and uh, see how does it happen. Like for example here uh, if we start with EE that is this is also E and this is also E then the transition state would look like this where we have maintained the E here and we also maintain the E here when that transition state um, is formed and the CC bond is being formed as one can see this methyl is pointing downward and this, point, this is pointing upward and therefore here we have these two anti to each other. Uh, on the other hand if we take uh, the Z uh, <coughs> double bond here and the Z double bond here and then the transition state would look like something like this where you have this Z and this Z and therefore when the bond is formed here then we can see that the methyl group here is pointing upward the methyl group here is pointing downward. So this is how it is coming here. So EE, EE gives uh, uh, the similar type of uh, product as ZZ gives. So this is uh, uh, an in interesting thing of course and, and therefore the, uh, the geometry of the initial molecule becomes very important. In a similar fashion if we start with ZE as we have here Z and E uh, then of course uh, we can say that this is H, H, this is Z and this is uh, H here and H here, this is E and uh, this is of course uh, uh, Z and this is E. So same thing happens and in the transition state as you can see methyl is down this methyl is down here, here the, this methyl is up and, uh, and this is also up. So basically cis to each other, so they, they are, uh, they are um, cis to each other and here also they will be cis to each other. It does not really matter up or down in this particular case because uh, this is a racemic molecule. Now these uh, Claisen rearrangements and its variants are, are basically exothermic reactions. As, as you can see 84 kilojoule per mole and they are concerted pericyclic reactions 
now following superficial reaction pathway. So basically there are 3, 3 sigma topic rearrangement uh, which is what is the periscyclic reaction. But there is a substantial solvent effects that are observed, more polar solvents accelerate the reaction to a greater extent. Hydrogen bonding solvents gave the highest rate constant for example water ethanol mixture gives tenfold higher rate constant than in sulfolane. Sulfonin is this uh, uh, kind of non-polar solvent and some Lewis acids such as trivalent aluminum accelerate the reaction. Now this part is something very very important and that is the reason why this radical pair or more so as ion pair type of rearrangements or the intermediates that are the transient intermediates which do not affect the, uh, the orientation of their double bond but they are transiently available when the bond breaking and bond formation takes place and that has the uh, reason that is the reason why these things are observed that the polarity of the solvent makes the reaction rate faster because of such ion pair intermediates that are involved in it. So uh, we will stop it here and uh, take uh, some other aspects of uh, Gleason rearrangement in the next class because uh, there are say various alterations in terms of the Claisen rearrangement and they have a huge amount of uh, uh, application in uh, organic synthesis. Uh, so uh, please look at these carefully and uh, go through the what whatever content that I have discussed today and be prepared for the next class till then buy and have a, have a good uh, uh, study period. Thank you. Okay.